I'm told that the president of the Ezra's um, Nishim is not allowed to be in the room because they're positioned, as I understand, as a judge. New York City criminal court judge? Uh, yes. Civil court judge. Civil court judge. And we actually address that in the in the in the Okay, comments. so I, I just want to make sure that, that we're here. So so um, could you just comment on, on that in, in a brief second? Sure. So um, uh, the well, as to why she's not here. Sure. Uh, so the director of Ezra Snatchum uh, is Rachel Fryer, and she is a New York City civil court judge. And what happens when you're a judge, you're subject to certain uh, ethical restrictions. And so um, as a matter of due course, she had to check with the Judicial Ethics Committee to see if she would be able to uh, appear here and testify. And they, they indicated to her that, that she could not. Um, and that's why she's not here. And she is obviously a significant uh, part of the organization, and it's a big loss for us not to have her here, but uh, she obviously wants to follow the rules. And um, I should point out um, that Leah Levine is her daughter, uh, and um, so we'll be speaking. And then we also have the benefit of um, uh, uh, of Rachel's husband, David, who is here and will be providing comments as well. So okay. thank you. Thank, thank you. And so Leah and uh, Celia, if you would please come over here. Um, and then what I'm thinking as well is maybe Miriam, if you can come and like stand behind just so you can uh, be involved with uh, answering any questions. Ezra Session would like to thank the New York City Brunsco, the chair of the Endless Committee, the Endless Committee, and the hearing officer for this opportunity Thank you. Any of you may know Ezra Sessions Director Rachel Fryer, and may wonder why she's not presenting tonight. Rachel very much wanted to be here this evening to make this presentation. It is her passion, Ezra Session. However, as you may know, Rachel is a New York City civil court judge, and as a judge, she is subject to the restrictions on the judges providing public testimony. To make sure that she follows those rules, she consulted the Judicial Ethics Committee and was advised this past Friday that she could not attend this evening. While that is certainly disappointing to Judge Fryer and all of us here at this session, she needs to follow these rules. So I make this presentation tonight to the best of my ability. At times, it may be necessary to consult with her to respond to particular questions, which she will be available by phone, email, and text. I have also with me Miriam Spry. An Ezra Snatchum volunteer EMT, Ezra Snatchum volunteer EMT, who's a first aid teacher, labor coach, and doula, Leah Levine, director of outreach and development of Ezra Snatchum. Leah? Is this good? Yeah. When my mother, Judge Ruchi Fryer, began volunteering to help the women of Ezra Snatchum as a pro bono lawyer, she had no idea that she would become their director and a paramedic. For so many years, she worked so hard for this very day. We never thought that she would not be able to be here to share in this great moment, to speak with her passion to you, the respected members of the, of the Remstro Ambulance Committee. But my mother's passion is not hers alone. It is mine too, and it is the dream of so many women to have their need met, to fill the gap in pre-hospital emergency care so that we women can have the care that we need, which is an ambulance for the women and by the women of our community. I'm so proud and honored to be here representing my mother. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, as, as women, are, um, why, why don't you join us all? <laughs> and, and again, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, so I apologize if I told, it, if I told the joke, I'll be glad to tell you another one, but I don't know the answer. Why, why don't you join Hans Solo? That, that's what we want to do for a number of years. That's what we were trying and trying and trying, but Hans Solo doesn't allow um, females to join. Are, wait, so wait, you're saying females are not allowed to join? They're not allowed to, um, to join Hans Solo. They, they want to be only men in their um, agency. Okay, so... so if Hatsola, well, so Hatsola does not have any females that no. are in the response groups. That was the only thing that we wanted. That was like, you know, the best option. But they, after, you know, time and time and time again, asking and asking, they always rejected it. 
an idea many, many years ago. This was, like you said, it was a league that was suppressed for so many years. I, I'm not sure. I, I, to be quite honest with you, the question was in the back of my mind. It's, it's one of those implicit things, and, and maybe sometimes it's so. I, I think it's important that, that you mention, like, okay, so if, if you've got a solo, and if if you have a, a response from within the Jewish community, um, the existing Jewish community cannot provide a first responder who is female. Am I accurate or is it, am I not? Other than, 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 than your organization. So my mother actually did go, um, when, like a few years ago when she was starting, to, to the rabbis, um, and they did tell her, and I remember it happening, that Hatzalah doesn't feel it's going to be appropriate to have male and females together working in the same um, EMS agency. They feel like, you know, it could lead to inappropriate things. So the, the rabbis told us, open up on your own. They felt that would be the best way to keep, you know, to get the women the help that they need and to make sure we don't get into any inappropriate situations. Okay, and, and, and I, I appreciate this, wine. I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of Hatzola, and you know, we're, we're not using um, you know, rules of, of hearsay and, and, and evidence like that, so I'm, I'm not gonna ask you know, whether that is true or not true. Um, but, but, but my concern is, um, and, and I hope that someone will correct if, if I'm misunderstanding, that if a female said, hey, I'm an EMT, I'm, an, I'm a doula, I'm an RN, I'm, I'm this, I'd like to be part of a first response team, um, where do I sign up, Hatzola? Um, you, they would you say, say no. Say, thank you, but but we wouldn't be able to use the services. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Right. Be, so. I'll be super quick. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and I followed the formation of Ezra Snowden for five years. And I'm Orthodox. Um, I'm not Hasidic, so I have kind of like an insider outsider status. And I can tell you, for following these women since 2013, the need for this. For Ezra Smash and for an ambulance is so great within this community. This 12 women that are here are nothing compared to the hundreds of women that I've met that were so thankful to finally have women meeting their needs. Um, I think it's ironic also that Ezra Snushin had tried to join Hansella for 30 years. They have banned women from joining. And not only did they not let them join, they're now not letting them start their, start their own organization. So they're essentially just trying to silence women completely. They don't want them in, and they don't want them to have their own thing. Um, I think it's... Um, in the age of Me Too, is discrimination. Um, and, and to have a secular lawyer judge the modesty of women and say that advertising is immodest is really out of line. Um, he knows nothing um, that is not Jewish law, that, is, that, is, that not everyone in Harvard agrees with that. So he's just a mouthpiece. Um, you should know that. But there's a great, great need for this organization. I'm pregnant, I have three other children. I've been in situations where I actually, in Queens, did have to call hot cells because there's a snowstorm. And as I'm having contractions, waddling in snow that's up to my knees, the hot cell member wouldn't hold my hand to help me walk because he didn't want to touch me. So you have a, a culture that there's intense segregation, but then all of a sudden you want that to go away. That's not realistic. People don't just walk out of those, those, those things that are in you since the time you're three years old in an instant. And there's a lot of talk about response time. And I want to just clarify that the way you're calculating response time is from when the call is made until the ambulance comes. But you're not factoring all the time that the woman has waited to call. She's calling much later than she would call. She's hesitating. She's waiting hours, 20 minutes, whatever it is. That response time is much more. And you have no way of measuring that. So. Um, I want to just say that um, it would be a real travesty of culture and justice if you do not approve this application. Thank you.
Rachel Mandelbaum. I actually have twin babies at home and a family of many. Thank God. I came here tonight, proudly so, to attest how Hassel was there for me in the most vulnerable moment. And with much professionalism and compassion, they responded efficiently, which is well known, and acted so appropriately, which calmed me to an extreme degree. In fact, at the time, I was living in a building, and I had a neighbor who realized that I was in a state of emergency, um, in a state of labor. She was actually skilled and educated in the field, offered to come help, and I refused. I preferred having Hatzal there. Many women in this crowd also have been assisted in childbirth by Hatsula in a very respectful, um, special way. And it is actually very honorable um, for me to be able to do this in my gratification and uh, thankfulness to Hatsula. Um, I do feel that I'm also a principal in the school and I've seen Hatsula in different situations, but in childbirth, uh, in, in, in labor, I felt more comfortable having Hatsula. I actually had the next baby where I Hashem managed to make it to, Hatsula, to the hospital, but I needed Hatsula to get me there because it was of time essence, and I chose to call them again, which I think says a lot. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Simeon Litman-Tolos oh. is, is Russian. Um, is there any way, I, I have yes. two of our primary witnesses in our case in chief, but uh, may have to go to a bar mitzvah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I get that. I'm, I'm going to have to go to a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I so, second the motion. Uh, so, uh, I, I guess I'm, the hard I'm, thing is, is we have our burden of proof. Um, I, just, I, I, I agree. So uh, Mr. Mr. Blitman, how, how urgent is your one minute? If you do one minute, do that. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you need to, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll try and forbear nature and, and try and retain modesty myself. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Blitman. I'm a speech language pathologist. I grew up in Borough Park, practicing for 20 years in Borough Park, over 20 years. I have a PhD from Columbia University, and I love Hatsala. I have many of my friends that are Hatsala, and I really had lack of sleep over Shabbos, over Saturday, thinking about this because I didn't want to put down on Salah, and I still don't want to put down on Salah, because I think the woman that stood before, they have a right to stand because they represent people that help the community. However, as a speech-language pathologist um, in the neighborhood, I have plenty of people that call me up on the phone and say, do you have a female therapist that can touch the throat when you have a voice disorder? And I will sometimes have to uh, contract out because they don't want to be touched by a male speech pathologist. Um, there's a sensitivity, and I think the word um, sensitivity is broad range. And I think that when you take the sensitivity of somebody that, comes to, that doesn't want to come to you because they've never been touched by a male, in today's day and age, not even in the Hasidic world, but in the world in general, you have Hollywood executives opening up their doors or having people sit in the room because they're afraid of being exposed or being made fun or, or, or violating sexual harassment. This is not about sexual harassment. This is sensitivity. This is people who don't want to be touched by a male. Now, correct, Hatsala is a phenomenal organization. The response time is amazing. But the sensitivity of a female is pertinent. You know, as a kid, I remember meeting Herschel Weber, the originator of Hatzalaf, in the Pan Am terminal when I was five years old. I looked at him as the Babe Ruth. I still do. He's the Babe Ruth. He was my hero and is my hero. But that was a different time. That was a time where there was nothing like Hatzalaf. He invented this organization and they helped. And they continue to help the community. Ezra's notion is not a competitive force. It's dealing with a need. 
Yes, maybe the response time, as Mr. Wiseman is saying, uh, is not what he considers parallel to Atzala, and maybe there's other factors, because I don't see statistics being presented here. I don't see numbers. When I look at fact-checking, I want to look at data. I need to look at a control group, and I have to look at the individual variations. Where are they getting these numbers from? When I look at a peer-reviewed journal, I have to see hard data, not hearsay, from anyone. And that requires data. And that requires a community that can have both. And I think it's, it really upsets me, because I love Hatzalah. I think what Ezra Snushim is really here to help. It's not here to go against Hatzalah. And I think that the woman that stood before, if their husbands are on Hatzalah, they should be commended. They have to, their husbands leave at 2 o'clock in the morning. Did you speak with Ezra Snasham prior to signing that statement? No. Did you speak with Hatzala prior to signing that statement? I spoke with community members. Some of those community members may be members of Hatzala's, but I spoke with community members. Okay. And the rabbis, that's the one predominantly who I spoke to. Did, did any of those rabbis speak with anyone from Ezra Snasham to ask their side? I have no idea, and I think that that's for a different discussion after this forum, you know, to make peace between the two. Well, and, and I that. think it's a different issue. My, my understanding, and I, by, by all means, I'm a, my understanding is a matter of Jewish law to make a decision that it's custom or a law to get input from both sides. Is that true? 100%. And so why didn't that happen here? I believe that the rabbis in who are members of the community are well versed in this situation. As you've heard from the previous speakers, this has been going on five years and maybe even much longer. And they have a very detailed knowledge of what's going on. And I think that that is the basis of their, of their uh, comments in this letter. And a few more questions. Um, the, the letter indicates that there's been a determination that modesty doesn't apply that's a determination from the standpoint of Jewish law, is that correct? In an emergency situation, when volunteer emergency professionals come in a life threatening situation, then that's what you have to think about first. Sure, and so that, but that's as a matter of Jewish law. So in, in other words, the, the statement made by the rabbis that modesty doesn't apply, that's a conclusion based on Jewish law. That's, I'm just trying to, understand that that's a, a, a Jewish legal that's what, that's what the rabbis do. Okay, okay. sure. <clears throat> and so uh, that's, a, that's a Jewish legal determination. But, but, but then, then how do those rabbis trump the feelings of the women from a cultural standpoint? You might conclude that it's not a, it, it's, it's, it's legally okay. But the whole issue here is that Culturally, they feel it's not okay. And, and, and I'm just wondering, and I'm just putting it in context and respectfully, but how can a group of men determine what's appropriate for women? Okay, it's a very good question that you asked. The Jewish life circulates around the Jewish law. Jewish law is interpreted by the rabbis for everyone, from conception till death, whether it's an end of life issue, or beginning of a life issue and everything in between. Whether it's a business that you go to, whether it's a marriage that you go to, everything is consulted with the rabbi, and the rabbi, based on his knowledge of the Torah and rules, gives that, gives that, gives his 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 uh, his ruling what it should be. And therefore, they this has been going on for generations. Oh, one, one, one. Females could also say precious lives. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna True. One more. Good follow-up. Hi, Rabbi, one more question. No problem. <laughs> How come Hatzala doesn't accept women members? <laughs> if you know. <laughs> you got about an hour. Uh, no, 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 no. They aren't. Look, we're not here to go into the concepts, principles, policies of this wonderful organization, the holy of holiness that Jews have called that solo, as was indicated by all of the women before we were speaking. We're not going there now because that's not the right forum. I'll invite you to my house, over tea or coffee, 
and I'll invite some other people, and then we can talk about it. But this is not the forum. We're here, as you know, to, be, to, to venture a verdict about a new service. This new service is, in our opinion, in my opinion, opinion of the rabbis who signed it, 49 rabbis from the community, representing a majority of the constituents of the community. It's of their opinion that this would not be a wise thing to do now. Now, whether they should accept women or not, that's a different, different topic and subject, which I'd be glad to talk to you about. How much you charge? <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Rachel Schmidt. Many of you know me. I am a psychotherapist in private practice. I service the Borough Park community and the Williamsburg community as well. We're here today to discuss the need of an ambulance service for Ezra Snashen. Allow me to explain. Orthodox women are raised in a very modest way and modesty is our badge of honor. There is nothing more sacred to an Orthodox woman than her modesty. Not her money, not her house, not her jewelry. My modesty is the most important thing to me in my whole life, personally speaking. But I'm not here to speak about myself. I'm here to speak for my clients. I'm here to speak for the community of women. They should have choices. Now, that young lady who spoke that she called Hatzalah, congratulations to you. I'm glad you made that decision. That was your choice. But I want to have a choice that if I prefer a female, educated, professional, medical um, service, that I want to have that choice to have that professional medical service at my side. I want to say, I love Hatzalah. There is nobody that I appreciate, and there's nobody I respect more than Hatzalah. It is just only in this area that we have a difference. Go ahead, do your good work. God will pay you back. But please, let Ezra Snashim do their work as well. Let him make room for another organization. Make room so that the woman who prefer a professional medical service, that they could have that choice. The Orthodox woman, as you were mentioned before, from the age of, does not shake hands, from the age of three, we cover our elbows, we wear high neck, we wear long dresses, we wear tights. Our children are so protected. Our little girls are wearing long tights. Now you take this little girl and she grows up and she strained to live a good, healthy, intimate life, a life with her husband, but her husband only. And suddenly she's in an emergency situation. She has to give birth. And now suddenly she feels that she has no choice. Her modesty is ripped off. Ladies and gentlemen, she feels emotionally raped. I promise you I'm not exaggerating. And I speak as a psychotherapist, LCSW. I have a full practice, please don't call me. And I represent the people who have not just, I cannot speak about my personal clients, I'm sure you can understand that. But I can represent the community. I can represent my children. I can represent my sisters. I can represent the females who, to whom also modesty is the most sacred possession that they have. Please, I appeal to you, I beg you, allow us to continue to be modest if you look at the history, if you look at biblical times, you will see it has always been woman helping woman. A hundred years ago was woman helping woman. I was, my mother gave birth to me 67 years ago with a midwife, and she did pretty well, I think, asked my husband. <laughs> so, but I'm not putting away doctors. Of course we need doctors, please. I'm only saying that the woman should have a choice that if she's in an emergency vulnerable stage, Please, I beg you, allow her to maintain her dignity. Allow her to maintain her modesty. Allow her to give birth to a healthy, healthy child without having to make a compromise. Not on the health of the child and not have to make a compromise on her modesty.